one of the things that Paul taught us in Corinthians that we don't know anywhere else, didn't write about in Romans and Ephesians, here's what he wrote. There would be temporary spiritual gifts. Some spiritual gifts were going to be necessary to establish the church in the world while writing the second half of the Bible called the New Testament. The canon of the New Testament or the New Covenant is dynamic because it's based on the teachings of Jesus Christ. So what you have beginning at Pentecost in 30 AD with the advent of the Holy Spirit and the beginning of the church is spiritual gifts. And Paul put the spiritual gifts into two categories of temporary gifts. He put two, in, 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 in chapter 13, he called some of them, he put the category of abolish and the category of cease. Now, we studied that. You can, listen to me. You can't jump in the middle of a, of a discussion that Paul's having this intense and think you know it. You've got to study chapter 12 because 13 comes from it. And you have to study 13 because 14 comes from it. It's like 100, 200, and 300 level of study. You have to study chapter 12 to understand 13, 13 to understand 14. If you jump in the middle, you'll just be confused. So if you just by chance come in the middle of a study, you're required to go back and review it. You can go to our website, doctrinalstudies.com. You can pick up our Sunday called 2020 Spiritual Gifts. And John keeps them uh, just current as much as he can. You can uh, live stream with us, of course, under normal conditions. Now, today we're going to pick up our subject matter in chapter 13. And once you go back, I'm going to, I, although we're looking at 11 through 13, we got to have 10. 10 is important. 10 is important in chapter 13. Here's what, here's what it says, and then we're going we're gonna to get chapter 13. Here we go. He says, when the perfect comes, prior to that, he says, some gifts are going to be abolished and some gifts are going to cease during the church age. Truthfully, that's all going to occur. All of that temporary gifts are going to occur between 30 and 100 A.D., between 30 and 100 A.D., some gifts, gifts are going to cease and the rest are going to be abolished. Now, you'll learn that as we go along. Some are now, so we're in a passage. Some are going to be abolished, and he calls those partial, and some are going to cease. Now, in verse 10, he says, but when the perfect comes, the partial gifts will be done away with or abolished. Kata Argeo will be abolished. Now, you, it's really important you understand that. Now, again, if you, just, if you just dropped in on chapter 13, you're going to have to go back and do, if, if this is interesting to you, and it should be, you're going to have to go back and study chapter 12. <clears throat> okay? When the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. Verse 11. Remember, he's talking about spiritual gifts. When I was a child, I used to speak as a child, That's, and that was normal, like going to grammar school. Going to grammar school, you have to learn the alphabet, and you have to learn, you know, decimals of tens and all that. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I thought as a child, I reasoned as a child. But when I became a man, I did away, abolish, did away. That's partial gift talk. Right? The word done away is done away. It's the same word, kata argeo. The child part, our partial gifts are going to be done away with because a mature man, the mature man doesn't need it. Now, he's using an example of childhood versus adulthood. And he's talking about spiritual gifts, right? His subject is spirit. He's not really talking about childhood and adulthood. He's talking about spiritual gifts. Partial gifts are like childhood, but when the perfect comes, that's like manhood. 
That's like adulthood. Do you understand that? If you don't, you're going to have to go back and study all that. For now we see dimly partial, partial gifts. Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then when the perfect comes face to face. <laughs> now I know in part a mirror dimly, but then I shall fully know just as I also am fully known. <clears throat> That's the perfect. When the perfect comes, it will be like face to face. It won't be, somebody won't look at you uh, like looking in a mirror, not even yourself. Verse 13, but now abides faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these, love. Now, that, there's a lot of confusion about that idea. He's not saying that love is greater. He's not saying that love as an idea is greater than faith and greater than hope. What he's talking about is the context of love. The context of love. The whole context of love that Paul is talking about is connected with spiritual gifts. Agreed? Come on. Verses 1 through 3, he listed, he listed seven gifts, and he says, love is greater. He says, if your gift functions without love, it profits you nothing, and you are nothing. Think about that. First three verses. Love is not greater than faith. It depends on the context. Do you understand that? For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourself is a gift of God. Is that, is that not perfect? Yeah. Is, would, would he not say that faith is the greatest? Yes, contextually. Please understand that. It doesn't mean that love is superior to faith. It's the context of it. Love is superior in context. Do you understand that? The whole subject of chapter 13 is not about love. It's about how love works in spiritual gifts. The subject of chapter 13 is spiritual gifts. It's not love. He's showing you how important love is to the function of spiritual gifts within the body of Christ, the church. See... If you take a scripture out of context, you're in trouble. And there's a good example. People go to chapter 13, verse 13, and don't discuss the rest of the chapter, and, and there, there's the way they get that answer. Depends on the context. Well, anyhow, I just teach it. It's up to you what you want to do with it. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get in our morning study. Okay? Bible. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't live it. You can't learn it, and you can't live it. And carnality, evidence of carnality is personal sin, mental attitude type sin, overt sin, sins of the tongue. What do I need to do to address that? How do I address carnality? The evidence of personal sin, I confess my sin. First John 1, 9, I confess my sin. He is faithful. God is faithful. In regard to my sin, God is faithful and just to forgive me that sin because of the work of Christ on the cross. My sins have all been forgiven. This forgiven is not about salvation. This forgiveness is about spirituality. I confess my sin to be spiritual because this is the church age. This is the new covenant. The dynamics of walking in the power of the second member of the omnipotence of God. Father, we're so thankful today for these that have come our way by the automobile and the internet. I pray today, Father, we put our thinking cap on, which means to be under the ministry of the Holy Spirit and allow him to teach us something that is revolutionary and and in, in the way we think, in the way we behave, in, and it's revelational in, in our belief system. 
about spiritual gifts. Encourage our hearts today, Father, with the truth of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. I want to do a quick review with you. While 1 Corinthians 13 is one of the great chapters on God's agape love, Paul was applying it to spiritual gifted ministries in the body of Christ, the church. We learned, we have learned, that Paul put spiritual gifts into two categories. He put them into the category of abolish, called partial, and cease. We now refer to these two categories in church history as temporary spiritual gifts. That's why. We learned that God's love never fails. The word fail is pipto, P-I-P-T-O. It's a present active indicative third person, singular, and it means never come to an end. Never come to an end. They will never love God's love will never be abolished in your life and will never end. Gifts, some gifts will. Do you understand that? Well, that's how he opened up chapter 13, verse 8. Love never fails. He used the word blippo, meaning never come to an end. Because sp some spiritual gifts will cease, but love won't. Some will be abolished, but love won't. You understand? Love will carry you through. God's love will carry you through. We learned. We learned and listen, that's why he closed chapter 13, 13 with the greatest is love. Right? What is greater, spiritual gifts or love? Love is greater than spiritual gifts because spiritual gifts must have the love connected to it, the love connection in ministry to the body of Christ the church. It's the love connection with spiritual gifted ministry. So how important it is for you to walk in the spirit? Enormous. Because the first fruit that Paul mentioned of walking in the spirit in Galatians 5, 16, in verse 22, he said, agape love. The fruit of the spirit is love. We learned that the partial gifts, the ones that are going to be abolished, would be abolished by the coming of the perfect during the church age. We learned that in verses 8 through 10 of chapter 13. We learned, this is stuff we've already learned. We have learned that the perfect, totelion, T-O is the definite article, teleon, T-E-L-E-I-O-N. Listen to me now. The perfect totelion, I gave it to you the way it is in the scripture. Totelion is nominative, singular, neuter. It's a neuter. It's not a person. It's a thing. Right? Neuter is neuter in all languages. Here's what's interesting. That's in, that's in 1310, totelion. See, the word partial is used in verse 10. Do you know what's interesting? In the Greek language, when he, the word partial in the Greek language begins with T-O, which is a definite article with totelion, T O. T-E-L-E-I-O-N, totelion. That's a definite article with the word telion. This phrase, this phrase partial begins with T-O, which connects us to totelion with a prepositional phrase, ek plus the genitive of meros, the part. And what he just told you is that the partial, we know in part and we prophesy in part, is part of the totalion, the perfect. Did you get that? 
going to do this one more time because you didn't write it down, and you'll never remember it tomorrow. Maybe, but you, it may not matter to you. Totelion, nominative singular neuter, the word partial, nominative singular neuter. And it's connected by to, the definite article, with totelion, which means that the partial is part of the perfect. We know in part. But when the perfect comes, what we know in part, we'll, we'll fully know. Da 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 da. These are the ones that are going to be abolished. There's no way you can see that in English. What I just told you, you cannot see in English. But you can see it clearly in the Greek. Guys going through a Greek class could easily tell you that. This teaches that the partial gifts were part of the perfect during the church age, the early church age, from 30 to 100 A.D. We know that historically. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul has been showing the superiority of God's agape love working through spiritually gifted ministries within the body of, of Christ, the church. If you will recall, we opened up chapter 13 with the first three verses with Paul laying out a form of understanding with the word if. Look back there for a moment. The word if, in verses 1, 2, and 3, he used as a marker to identify seven gifts. With the subject of love, and he told you, because these were the gifts that people were all goofy about, that without love, these gifts will not profit you. And he goes through a whole discussion on it. We've already studied this. This is all in review. Today's lesson is going to look at five ways the perfect is superior to the partial gifts. Point number one. Once again, the Greek grammar is important to our study regarding the superiority of God's love to the idea of temporary spiritual gifts. <clears throat> Certain spiritual gifts will be abolished and others will cease during the early church age, but God's love will never fail. That's his point. Agreed? Therefore, love, contextually, love is the greatest in regard to spiritual gifts. Okay. That's all I'm saying. To make Paul's final doctrinal point, which is recorded in verses 11 through 13, we will need to look at Paul's outline by Greek grammar. This is so important. One of the great hermeneutical principles of the study of the Word of God as a teacher to a congregation is ice. What is that? What is the histor ice? Ice a guy. What is the historical background of the text and the book? How did the writer lay his argument out in the grammar? Exegeting. And what is the categorical thinking that we need to take from the scriptures? to our practical theology of living our life according to the scriptures. Ice. It's a hermeneutical principle. I'm telling you that you cannot study Paul without understanding that hermeneutical principle, which has absolutely been thrown under the bus in seminaries today. Nobody teaches that. Nobody except our school. We're old school. Our school teaches it. In verse 11, Paul is going to show the difference between partial gifts, which are ch uh, thinking like a child, 
and adulthood. Verse 11. Now watch this. The word when is hot, hote. It's a conjunction plus an imperfect indicative. Hote plus the imperfect shows progressive duration in past time of childhood. Explained by when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, and I reasoned like a child. Watch what he did by putting it in an imperfect tense. He shows that when you look from an adult level back, you see a progression, a, gramma, a, a grammar school. We used to call it grammar. Anybody remember when we used to call it grammar school? <laughs> now they call it elementary. We call it grammar school. What a good reason that was. We used to actually teach grammar. <laughs> and correctly spelling words. One of the first books I had to buy in the first grade was a dictionary. <gasps> Can you imagine? I actually bought a dictionary. It was required for spelling and understanding words. Today, kids in high school, they're not required to correctly spell. Listen, your paper would be full of red notes. And when you get back, you've made that again. You went to the blackboard and wrote it out ten times. William, ten times. So here's what he says. Hote plus the in imperfect is progressive duration during past time of childhood. During that period, I, it was normal for me to be in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade. Well, I guess we, is sixth grade, and then we go to middle school? Okay, whatever that is, I don't know. But anyhow. That's what he's talking about. I progressed in the past, in my past life. And if I didn't, I didn't get into adult thinking. But in the past, I was in kindergarten. I thought like a kindergarten. I spoke like a kindergarten. All the way up until I became an adult, which would be like high school thinking. It was normal for me to be in the first grade. Uh, uh, kindergarten, then go to the first grade. Oh, look how much I learned. And then the second grade and third grade. Oh, look how much I learned. And fourth grade and fifth grade. Look how much I've learned. Hopefully. <laughs> that we're positive thinking here in the imperfect tense. The indicative mood of the Greek reality is reality. Here is the reality of your past life. You thought like a child. And it was right. That's the way you're supposed to. That's how you grow up. Come on now. That's how you grow up to become an adult. Now watch what he says. When, right, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, thought like a child, reasoned like a child. Now what, that's, that's verse 11. That's 11a. Look at, look at 11b. When, that's hote, same word hote, when. That's a conjunction of time. Both are conjunctions of time and events. Connecting time and events. Hote, time and events. But look, he changed it from the imperfect to the perfect. Now, here's what he means. He said, but when, in the perfect indicative, it shows completion in the past time with completed results in the present time of adulthood. See, I used to, when I was a child, it was normal, and I progressed in the way I thought, and I progressed in the way I reasoned, and, and right? Until I reached manhood. And now, he says, but when I reached manhood, when I became a man, a near adult, compared to the child, the napios, I did away. Look at the word, it's kata argeo. That's the word abolish, the word done away and abolish. It's that same word. Certain gifts would be abolished. He's talking about partial gifts. Right? Of course he is. He used the same term, kata argeo, in the perfect tense this time, about adulthood. Now I've reached the stage where I think like an adult, I speak like an adult, and I reason like an adult, not like a child. I might have laps 
where I become childish, but I'm not a child. I'm an adult thinking like a child. I can become childish. See? When I became a man, I did away or abolished with the childish things of childhood. The childish things of childhood, we know that because he used the, def he used the definite article ta in the neuter. In the neuter. See, you can be childish as an adult, but that's not normal. When you're a child and you are a child, that's normal, right? He's talking about partial gifts. Partial gifts is the childhood, and the perfect is the manhood. Now watch. Did the person change? Yes. Is it diff two different people? I was a child and I became an adult. It's the same person? Okay. When I was a child, it's partial gifts. I only knew in part, I thought in part, yeah, yeah, yeah. But when the perfect comes, I would know fully, right? Partial gifts is childhood. The perfect comes for adulthood, right? That's all he's talking. That's all he's saying here. It's exactly what he's saying. Now, what changed? Look at look at look on your paper. What changed? With the abolishing of the partial gifts, what changed? Adulthood. The perfect came. The perfect is adulthood. As long as the partial's in, we don't have a man, we have a child. Agreed? Thinks as a child? Because when the perfect comes, it will be incorporated. The, the, what we knew in part will be incorporated into the full revelation. I, I, I knew in part, now I know fully. I prophesy in part, now prophecy is totally revealed. Are you with me? That's a gift he mentioned. Do you look at these passages in between Sunday and Sunday? Or you just depend on me to do it all for you? You ought to do a little bit of study. Gate question, when we get there, might be a gate question. At least make me look good. The childhood of the partial became the adulthood of the perfect. Therefore, there were no losses by the abolishing of certain spiritual gifts because the perfect brought them into the maturity of adulthood. Agreed? See, that's what he's saying. Is that sinking in? If it ain't, you're going to have to look at it over and over and over again. You're going to have to look at this at least ten times. That's William's philosophy, and I think he might be right. Now look at verse 12. He's going to use another analogy. The mirror versus face to face. He says, for now, he uses the, the particle gar, and he uses arte which is a temporal adverb of time connected to events. Arte. For now, the word now is arte. For now, we see in a mirror dimly. That's under partial gifts. But then, he, he goes from gar to day, adversative conjunction with tote, Temporal adverb of face to face, talking about when the perfect comes. That's 12a. Look at 12b. 13 chapter, verse 12b. Now, which is arte, now I know in part partial gifts, but then, see, he does it again. De tote. Adverb. Adver talking about adverb of time to connected to event. But then, de tote, I shall know fully just as I also have been fully known, perfect tense. In other words, the perfect is going to lock it all up.
verse 13. He concludes in verse 13, showing the superiority of God's agape love, that agape love is greater in context because it never fails. It will never fail. It will never end, even though temporary spiritual gifts are abolished and cease. Isn't that wonderful? That's Paul's point. Now, the spiritual gifts of tongue, tongues, the spiritual gifts of tongues and interpretation of tongues, which is a set of spiritual gifts that go together, are not part of the abolishing partial category. Right? Now, please tell me, he made two categories of temporary gifts. Greed, abolish, and cease. Abolish, kata argeo, cease, pao. It's very clear in the language. The spiritual gifts of tongue and interpretation are not part of the abolished partial category. They are part of the category called cease. Therefore, these gifts, talking about tongues and interpretation, will not be affected. Those under cease will not be affected by the coming of the perfect. Do you understand that? He's making this crystal clear, people. Now, if you recall what I taught you, they will cease, tongues and interpretation will cease by the co completing of the divine reason God gave them. And in the Greek language, their intransitive verb, the word cease is an intransitive verb, which means that something inside them, a transitive verb requires an object outside them that was connected with abolish. Something outside the partial gifts abolish. Something outside of them would cause them to be abolished. That would be when the perfect comes. Agreed? Well, look, you've just got to study the Bible. I mean, I, I didn't write it. I was just interpreting it. I'm telling you what it actually says. A transitive verb, the abolish gifts, are going to cease when the perfect comes, something outside themselves. When the perfect comes, it will incorporate the partials. Agreed? Not so with tongues and interpretation. The ceases will cease when their purpose of existence has reached its completion. Paul is going to teach you about that in chapter 14. So I'm not going to teach you till we get there because I'm having trouble with you getting to just through 13. And look, I get criticized for teaching this way. This is how the gift of teacher, pastor, is supposed to work. Hermeneutically, it's supposed to work under the principle of ice. If you will come to class and study with me under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, you will get what he taught me. You know how I study the Bible? To teach you under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And when I bring that message to you, if you will study under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we will become eye to eye on the subject matter. If you're going to try to sit, sit in class and study in carnality or human eye viewpoint, human eye, IQ point, you're not going to get this. You might as well stay home and slap. All right. Just telling you the way it is. Pazo, P-A-U-O, the word cease, 
It's going to be connected with tongues and interpretation, a set of gifts. is an intransitive verb. And you will see that clearly in chapter 14. You won't see it here. But you'll see it when I get there. In chapter 14. Well, I'm ready for a, get my cup of coffee, guys. So if you don't mind, let's take a break right here. Men will take the offering. We'll give it a little bit, apparently a little bit of time to fellowship and digest what we've had. And we'll come back and finish this lesson. You want, to, you want to be sure that you come prepared to really click in now when we get into uh, 3, 4, and 5 to conclude this. But I need a break. <laughs> so uh, I, need, uh, I had a cup of coffee, but it got cold on me. So let's have a word of prayer. The men will take the offering. We'll take a short break. Uh, then we'll reassemble to conclude our message today. Well, our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for these to come our way and what good students we have. I'm not fussing at them, Father. I hope they don't think I am. I'm just, I don't know when I'll pass this way again on this subject matter, and I've just got to cover it as thorough as I can, both for the web and for the people in class. If we do it right, Father, they can go back and they can study it and study it and study it on their own time in their own way. Uh, while we only have an hour of uh, hour or two here, it's my desire, Father, that we would understand the two categories that Paul said of spiritual gifts that would cease and be abolished during the church age, during the development of the church in the world. But when the perfect come, the abolished, they, they, it would be a better thing. It wouldn't be a bad thing. It would be a better thing. It would be a better thing because the perfect would come. The perfect would come. And it, it would incorporate all of the partial gifts and bring it into a, a greater revelation, a, a fuller revelation, not only of the truth of God's word, but the truth about ourself as we function under spiritual gifts in the church. Uh, Paul made it clear about fully known and fully known oneself. I pray, Father, as we close this service, this part of the service, I pray as we take the offering, we'd be wise stewards. People would give according as the Spirit has urged them to give. As one purpose is in his heart, Paul wrote, this is new covenant. And that we'd be wise in the way we spend it as a church to reach the most with the message of the truth of the gospel of Christ and the truth about the, how faith is developed in our life through the hearing and the hearing of the word of God. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We picked up verse 10. And we went through verse 13 in our first hour. We looked at how Paul laid it out in the Greek language, which is really important. And he's only dealing with the partial gifts that will be abolished. <clears throat> It'll be chapter 14, as we discussed in the close of the first hour. Uh, when we get into chapter 14, he will deal with the subject of the temporary gifts called tongues and interpretation. Point number three, partial gifts, the, the, by that, those who will be abolished with the coming of the perfect, did not coexist during the church age, right? They were in existence waiting for the perfect to come to incorporate them. Okay, partial gifts and the perfect did not coexist during the church age. When the perfect, totelion, comes, the partial, to, remember I explained that, totelion, when it says partial, it's made up the word to, the definite article like totelion, plus ek, plus the genitive of meros, meaning from the part. The part is part of the perfect. They're both neuter. Yep. Jesus is never mentioned in the neuter. 
No, of course not. <laughs> no, it's neuter. It's a thing. It's not a person. It's not the coming of Christ. That's for sure. Anyhow, gifts are for the church age. When Christ comes, church age is done, right? This is for the church. The spirit, we're talking about spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are for the church age. And he's saying during the church age, some are going to be abolished and some are going to cease. And we know that that was completed by 100 AD. Everything's going to be between, all of this temporary gifts is going to be somewhere between 30 and 100 AD. Time-wise, we know that historically. Okay. When the perfect comes, the partial will be abolished. Remember, that's a transitive verb in the Greek, which means something outside it, the perfect. When it comes, the perfect comes, it will incorporate the parts. Therefore, the partial gifts functioned prior to the coming of the perfect during the church age from the period some 70 years or thereabout from 30 A.D. Pentecost to the completion of the canon of Scripture. They were very important for the early church. The, the founding of the church in the world and the creation, of the writing and structure of the new covenant teaching, which we call the New Testament. We call it the New Testament, the new covenant teachings. <clears throat> Point number four, the perfect completed the partial gifts in the church age. That's Paul's point. What his doctrinal point is, is that the perfect completed the partial gifts in the church age. Remember that partial gifts were part of the perfect. When he said in verses 9 and 10, we know in part, that's the gift of knowledge, and we prophesy, that's the spiritual gift, in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be what? Abolished. And what it means is that they will be incorporated. All of this will be incorporated into the perfect. Therefore, the partial, that's misspelled in your Bible, uh, on my paper. Therefore, <laughs> therefore, the partial gifts were incorporated into the perfect during the church age. What we knew in part as a child is now going to be fully known as an adult. We're going to fully understand it. We're going to be able to fully speak about it and understand it and reason with it, right? Therefore, the partial gifts were incorporated into the perfect during the church age. The perfect is singular and neuter, and partial gifts by meaning are plural because they're several, and yet they're neuter. The partial is neuter because it goes with the perfect, which is neuter. And this teaches incorporation. The partials will be incorporated into the perfect. So it comes down, what is the perfect? And we're going to get out of church early today, believe it or not. Maybe. That's almost like the kiss of death in it for me to say that. Here's point number five. <clears throat> the perfect is the completed canon of scriptures, which we call the Bible. Now, you probably don't think anything about it because you grew up with a completed Bible. Think about that. Somewhere around 1 AD, we had the completion of the New Testament and with the New Covenant. The, see, the old, there's an Old Covenant New Covenant with the coming of Christ. He's going to fulfill the Old Covenant and establish a New Covenant. Right? And we don't, we, it's okay. We take it for granted. We call that the Bible, don't we? You don't have a completed Bible without the Old Testament, New Testament, as far as the Bible. You can have an Old Testament Bible, and you can have a New Testament Bible. We call it a half a book, right? Remember, you used to get these little, the little New Testament? We would call it, you know, a half a book. We used to, right? We put them in our coat pocket. Well, I used to carry it there. And I used it to witness to people. Uh, and listen, you, you understand how dynamic that is? Because that's the perfect. When the perfect comes, 
Listen, when the perfect come, which is the New Testament, agreed? Listen, every time you see, read in the Bible where it says Scripture and it's got a capital S, he's talking about the Old Covenant. Every bit of it's Old Covenant. When we pick up the Bible today, we speak as strongly and, and more confidently out of the New Testament than we do out of the Old Testament, agreed? When you teach the Bible, you teach with a lot more authority and assurance out of the New Testament than you do the Old Testament. In fact, a lot of Christians who love the New Testament, they think of the Old Testament as a historical book. It's actually a messianic book. It teaches of the coming of Christ, first coming. And the New Testament teaches of second coming of Christ. Because when Christ came, he fulfilled the Old Testament and is now, now brings in the New Testament called the teachings of Christ. The New Testament is called the teachings of Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. How did he do it? Well, he come, fulfilled the Old Testament, and now is then in his time began to teach and establish new covenant thinking. His disciples came along and expanded it out. They took the teachings of Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, took the teachings of Christ and expanded it out from the teaching, the basic theology of Christ while he was here and took it under the ministry of the Holy Spirit and expanded it throughout the church age. Think about that. That's our New Testament. That's the perfect. What a glimpse in the future Paul had in 60 A.D. See, Paul wrote this around 60, in the 60 A.D. business, somewhere in the 60s, right? Look at the vision he had on that through the Holy Spirit. When the perfect comes, then these gifts, that everybody was in it. In fact, these partial gifts were causing problems in the church. And he says, well, you know they're not permanent. The perfect is the Bible. That hasn't dawned on you yet. What you fail to realize how important the Bible is, they didn't have it in 60 AD. They were in the midst of writing it. They didn't have it. They're waiting on revelation. They're waiting on the revelation. And listen, the perfect, the perfect, the completion is not going to come till around 100 AD, roughly. So, yeah. I want to impress on you this morning how important your Bible is to you. Because Paul didn't have a completed one. Paul didn't have what we have. Paul did not have what we have. In fact, Paul died without having it. Paul died without having it. Paul died before it was completed. In fact, most of his disciples, the disciples of Christ, did die. The last guy that even gives a glimpse on it is John when he writes Revelation. I just try to impress upon you, when you read these great guys, you, you read books like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the book of Acts, Romans and Corinthians and Ephesians and Galatians and all these books. They did not have a Bible. They had an Old Testament canon of scriptures and everything else was in epistles. They were being written and people were gathering it like we do with doctrine. They were gathering into notebooks. 
you know, when you go to the foreign mission field, some places like where Rick has been, they don't have Bibles. They don't have Bibles. They get them, and they like loose leaf where they can, they take them and write off from them and pass the Bible, sheets of the Bible around. And, and listen, there's a lot of nations like that, aren't there, Rick? There's a lot of them. They don't have a Bible. I, I'm trying to create within you a real importance of your Bible. You take it for granted. None of the writers had it. All the writers of the New Testament did not have a Bible as we know it. They had an Old Testament canon, and they had loose, loose leaves called epistles, things that had been written to them from under apostolic authority, and they were gathering that. It's an amazing thing. What we have, and we don't even think anything about it. We throw the Bible here and there and like it's not a treasure. Where's your Bible? I don't know. Where's the last? I don't know. You wouldn't do that with your driver's license. You wouldn't do that with your credit card. You wouldn't do that with your wallet. It's all about priorities, isn't it? It's what we place great value on. I'm telling you, this is quite a book that you and I have. This is quite a book. The perfect is the completed canon of Scripture, which we call the Bible, a completed Old Testament, Old Covenant, New Covenant. Partial gifts were like the childhood compared to the perfect, like an adulthood. In James 1.25, James gets a peek into this idea as an early writer of the New Testament, the one who looks intently at the perfect law of liberty. He didn't call it just the law. He called it the law of liberty. And it's based on the concept of Galatians 1, 5, and 13. The freedom that has been brought into the world through Jesus Christ, dying on a cross, being buried and raised from the dead the third day, to bring us into a concept of freedom. F freedom from the law. The one who looks intently at the perfect, notice that's the definite article, ton, with teleon, neuter, by the way, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man shall be blessed in what he does. <clears throat> I took a course and paid money for it. I wish I'd never taken the course and wish I'd never spent my money. It was called textual criticism. I hated the course from the first day. I hated it worse at the end of the course. I can't tell you how many young pastors it destroyed with doubting the infallible written word of God. And when I was going through the course, every day I was, be cha I was challenged whether or not to believe the canon of Scripture that I carried around all the time, back then King James, was the absolute authority of the Word of God, and I was a pastor, I was going to go out and teach it, and I was going to tell my people to believe in it, to make life choice decisions, enormous life choice decisions based on the Word of God, and they were telling me, who can believe it? Who can believe it? And I was in seminary, to get something to believe in to teach my people. And every day I'd go in there and I'd come out of there and I'd be, I'd be so mad. They're trying to destroy my Bible. And it's the only book I got. It's the book that delivered me 
is the only book I got to deliver other people. And they're making me question every bit of it. Not question what I believe about it, but question the absolute authority of it. Listen in. So I would go in every day. I'd listen to all that foolishness. And I would say, trying to rescue some of my friends, because I didn't believe what they were telling me. I had to answer the questions to get a grade so I could get my degree and get out of there. So God gave me a passage of Scripture, and every day they told me my Bible wasn't worth reading. I gave them this Scripture. I still love this piece of Scripture. It's what gave me sanity through that stupid course. Jesus, red print, said, and I told him, I said, I'm going to take this over anything else you've ever got to tell me. I can believe your word or I can believe his word, and I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to take his. I said it every day of my life when they went in there and told me not to believe the Bible. So they hated to have me stand up and read this. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away. My word will still be solid, standing strong. Not a jot nor tittle can be changed. In the Hebrew, that's the equivalent to saying uh, dotting an I and crossing a T. Not even dotting an I or crossing a T can be changed by man. Those are my favorite verses. I quote them all the time. I quoted them for me, try to rescue some of the young guys in there that were really struggling. Do not let them take away the authority of the Word of God from your life. Either that or choose another field. Not a jot or a tittle. The old King James, not a jot or a tittle. That's Hebrew. That's Hebrew. That's the equivalent of saying every I, God dotted every I, I and crossed every T. Don't you let, let anybody tell you different. Jesus taught that. And so the New Testament is built on that kind of structure, people. Listen to what Unger or Ryrie says in my study Bible in my Ryrie study Bible, which I love. He says, talking about the perfect law, the law of liberty of James 1.25. And this guy had more degrees than I have, but it's not about the degrees you have. It's about the sense you have about it. He said, the perfect law, the law of liberty, the Bible itself, though at the time this letter was written, James, only the Old Testament and the teachings of Christ has scriptural authority. And boy, was he right. And that's what Paul is talking about, about the perfect. All right? Neuter, James 1.25. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll go home after Rick gives us a pledge. Well, our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way. The Word of God. Old Testament, New Testament. We call it the Bible. There's as much authority in one side as there is on the other. It is the Bible. It is the authority of the Word of God. And God Himself said, through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, not a jot or a tittle, The word of God that I place in the hands of man for human history is forever. It will be the book in heaven. It will be the book in heaven. So learn it while you're on earth. Father, I pray that we would understand the importance of the Bible and the spiritual gifts we have and how they work in conjunction 
For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.